cardboard boxes. Calvin has an obsession with corrugated cardboard boxes, which he adapts for many different uses. Forms include a transmogrifier, a device that can change any object into another object, a duplicator, which can make copies of any object, and a flying time machine. Building a transmogrifier is accomplished by turning a cardboard box upside down, attaching an arrow to the side, and writing a list of choices on the box. Upon turning the arrow to a particular choice and pushing a button, the transmogrifier instantaneously rearranges the subject's chemical configuration, accompanied by a loud zap. Calvin makes his first foray into the world of transmogrification when he temporarily turns himself into a tiger, but he finds the experience disappointing. Calvin reuses some of this technology when he cleverly converts an ordinary water gun into a portable transmogrifier gun, a device which saves his life when he finds himself falling from high altitude. The time machine is built by flipping the transmogrifier back so that the opening faced upwards again. One uses it by donning a pair of goggles in order to contend with vortexes and light speeds and climbing into the vehicle. Facing the front, makes the machine go forward in time, and facing backwards makes it travel into the past. Calvin and Hobbes discover these time travel mechanics when they attempt to go into the future in order to bring back a few futuristic inventions and patent them in the present, securing a fortune for themselves. However, they face the wrong way and end up in the Jurassic period, bringing them face to face with a very large dinosaur. A duplicator is crafted by turning the box on its side. Whatever is put in the box will be duplicated with a boink sound, hence the book title Scientific Progress Goes Boink. Calvin envisions having a small team of duplicate Calvins whom he could send off to school so he could go about his own business during school days. However, the new Calvins prove to be exact replicas with the same reluctance to go to school and thus become difficult to control. Calvin later adds an ethicator switch to his duplicator, allowing a duplicate to be designated good or evil, since he believes that a duplicate of his well-buried good side could cause no harm. This experiment is successful at first, with the good duplicate willingly doing Calvin's homework and going to school, but soon this adventure too leads to disaster. In consequence, Hobbes remarks, you're the only person I know whose good side is prone to badness. Calvin's last cardboard box invention is the cerebral brain in Hansotron, which, combined with a colander, creates a thinking cap, a garment which enhances his mental prowess, inadvertently causing his head to swell in addition. Upon activation, this machine goes brzap. Like his other inventions, the cerebral in Hansotron fails to change drastically his life. Even with his cerebral augmentation, he is unable to write a school report up to Miss Wormwood's standards. Most of the other characters do not see his inventions as real. For example, when Calvin transmogrifies himself into an owl or a tiger, his parents do not observe the transformation. Only he and Hobbes see the change. This is a similar dilemma to that of Hobbes' existence. See above. Wagon and Sled Calvin and Hobbes frequently ride downhill in a wagon, sled, or tobog, depending on the season, and ponder the meaning of life, death, God, and a variety of other weighty subjects as they hurtle downhill. The course of the vehicle and the obstacles that the characters negotiate as they travel frequently serve as metaphors for and parallel the subject of conversation, and the rides almost always end in a spectacular crash. The wagon temporarily served as a spacecraft when Calvin and Hobbes realized that the human race was laying waste to Earth by polluting it. They decided to go live on Mars, but returned soon after when they realized that the native Martians, or weirdos from another planet, were terrified of Earthlings. This may have been a case of rumor preceding them. The prospect of terrestrial life polluting Mars as well as Earth was a bleak one. Although this particular wagon ride did not end in a crash, it once again served as an outlet for a subject matter of importance. Snowballs and Snowmen During winter, Calvin often engages in snowball fights, which he almost always loses, 
usually throwing them at Susie, but always resulting in Calvin getting buried in the snow as retaliation. Calvin also builds snowmen, but these are usually grotesque, monstrous, deformed creatures, i.e. two-headed snowmen, snow monster with tentacles devouring a bunch of snowmen, or snowmen getting hanged, buried, or holding their heads in their hands. Once, while walking down the street during winter looking at the snowmen in front of the neighbors' houses, Calvin's father exclaims to his wife, you can always tell when you get to our house, due to Calvin being the only one on the block who builds deformed snowmen. In one storyline, Calvin builds a snowman and brings it to life using the power invested in him by the mighty and awful snow demons, which turns evil, reminiscent of Frankenstein. The snowman turns itself into a mutant killer monster snow goon by giving itself two heads and three arms, and makes copies of itself that are eventually defeated by Calvin. Calvin, unlike Hobbes, thinks of snowmen as a fine art. Bill Watterson has said that this is to parody art's pretentious blowhards. Calvin Ball Calvin Ball is a game played almost exclusively by Calvin and Hobbes as a rebellion against organized team sports, like baseball, although the babysitter Rosalind plays on one occasion. Participants of Calvin Ball wear masks. When asked why, Calvin replies that no one is allowed to question the masks. The rules of the game, besides that a soccer ball and wickets are almost always used, are invented as they go along. But one consistent rule is that the rules can never be the same twice, which in itself is a self-denying paradox. Either player may change any rule at any time, so the only way to break the rules is by using one rule twice. Scoring is also entirely arbitrary. Hobbes has reported scores of Q to 12 and Oogie to Boogie. Calvin Ball could be described as a gnomic game, and thus bears a similarity to others such as Mornington Crescent. The reader first encounters the game after Calvin's horrible experience with school baseball. He registers to play baseball in order to avoid being teased by the other boys. While daydreaming in the outfield, he misses the switch and ends up making an out against his own team. His classmates mock him, and when he decides to walk away, his coach calls him a quitter. That Saturday, Calvin and Hobbes play Calvin Ball, a game far removed from any organized sport. The concept of playing Calvin Ball continues to appear in popular culture, usually when describing a situation in which the rules are changed according to someone's whims. For example, it doesn't really deal with the congressional incentive to play Calvin Ball with the budget. From the Q&O blog, 12-21-2005. Watterson has stated that the greatest number of questions he receives concern Calvin Ball and how to play it. Calvin Ball is essentially a game of wits and creativity, rather than a purely physical game. However, it's a running joke that Hobbes is typically more successful at Calvin's own game. School and Homework Calvin hates school and its attendant early morning risings, irate teachers, homework, and fellow students. Often, his mother has to force the unwilling Calvin to go up to the school bus. Occasionally, he manages to avoid the bus and his mother has to chase him down and force him to board or drive him to school. Calvin often waits for the bus with Hobbes and explains why an intelligent boy like himself does not need school. While at school, he commonly visualizes the building as a hostile planet and his teacher and principal as vicious aliens. Calvin usually lacks the company of Hobbes at school. Sometimes, Hobbes does his homework and reading while Calvin watches TV or reads comic books. In general, Calvin is depicted as a poor student who is unable to concentrate in class, has difficulty interacting with other students, and struggles with homework. On occasion, he gets good marks and positive feedback for work, but these are usually short-lived victories. Also on occasion, Calvin's inability to concentrate in class is compromised by inserting the class subject into his daydream, causing him to get the right answer. This includes spelling disaster while being dropped into an alien pit, though in real life he is participating in a spelling bee and blurting out the right answer at, from his point of view, a completely random moment. Calvin and Hobbes books. The books, labeled collections, form a complete archive of the newspaper strips, except for a single daily strip from November 28, 1985. 
The collections do contain a strip for this date, but it is not the same strip that appeared in some newspapers. The alternate strip, a joke about Hobbes taking a bath in the washing machine, has circulated around the internet. Treasuries usually combine the two preceding collections with bonus material and include color reprints of Sunday comics. A complete collection of Calvin and Hobbes strips in three hardcover volumes with a total of 1,440 pages was released on October 4, 2005 by Andrews McNeil Publishing. It also includes color prints of the art used on paperback covers, the story Spaceman Spiff, Interplanetary Explorer Extraordinaire, and a new introduction by Bill Watterson, who is now happily teaching himself to paint. Unfortunately, the alternate 1985 strip is still omitted, and two other strips, January 7, 1987 and November 25, 1988, have altered dialogue. To celebrate the release, Calvin and Hobbes reruns were made available to newspapers from Sunday, September 4, 2005, through Saturday, December 31, 2005, and Bill Watterson answered a select dozen questions submitted by readers. Like current contemporary strips, weekday Calvin and Hobbes strips now appear in color print when available, instead of black and white as in their first run. Early books were printed in smaller format in black and white that were later reproduced in twos in color in the treasuries, essential, authoritative, and indispensable, except for the contents of Attack of the Deranged Mutant Killer Monster Snow Goons. Those Sunday strips were never reprinted in color until the complete collection was finally published in 2005. Every book since Snow Goons has been printed in a larger format with Sundays in color and weekday and Saturday strips larger than they appeared in most newspapers. Remaining books do contain some additional content. For instance, the Calvin and Hobbes Lazy Sunday book contains a long watercolor Spaceman Spiff epic not seen elsewhere until complete. And the Calvin and Hobbes 10th anniversary book contains much original commentary from Watterson. Calvin and Hobbes, Sunday pages 1985 to 1995, contains 36 Sunday strips in color alongside Watterson's original sketches, prepared for an exhibition at the Ohio State University Cartoon Research Library. An officially licensed children's textbook entitled Teaching with Calvin and Hobbes was published in 1993. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the GNU Free Documentation License, available at www.gnu.org slash copyleft slash fdl.html.